Have you ever wondered about the habits of successful people, especially in becoming a better investor? How about those people who seem to always just have everything figured out? What are they doing that you aren't? And how can you tweak your daily routine so that you'll hit the next level in achieving your goals? Well, Stephen Covey's book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People is an excellent place to start. And today, I'm going to break it down for you by going through each of these habits in our new YouTube series where we explore TIP's favorite books. Hi, I'm Sean, and this channel is all about the principles of investing. From stock tips to iconic billionaires, the best strategies, and our favorite tools. TIP has everything you need to know. So please, if you're new, like and subscribe, and let's get started. Well, I think it's fair to be skeptical of self-help books since they often repeat the same tropes and can honestly be overgeneralized. This book by Stephen Covey really stood out as special to me. The seven habits have made an impression on my life and I hope this video can have a similar effect on yours. The book begins by highlighting the seven habits generally and explaining that our culture and Wall Street scream for results today, but that we must balance these demands with our future goals. We simply cannot afford to subordinate our health, family, and integrity. He then builds off a few key ideas which I think we should define. Firstly, being principles, which are fundamental laws that come innately to us and have guided humanity for thousands of years, such as honesty and fairness. In contrast, values are our interpretation of these principles. So in considering whether you should live a more principled life, ask yourself, how likely are you on your deathbed to regret the time spent with loved ones instead of, say, working more and watching more TV? To better incorporate these principles into our lives, we ought to understand paradigms, which he defines as our deep-seated perceptions of the world. Paradigms are our maps for life, and if you're using the wrong map, well, you'll get lost. In other words, the way we see the problem is the problem. While many self-help books today are superficial and only apply band-aids to chronic problems, Covey endorses changing our paradigm. And to live a principled life with the appropriate paradigms, we need strong habits to reinforce this new reality. We should start by considering whether our problems are truly because of others, or whether they simply stem from our own paradigms. Begin with assessing your character, assumptions, and motives. If you want to be trusted, first be trustworthy. By living within these habits, you'll define yourself from within and learn to build better relationships that serve you in your personal life and even your investing goals. Now, let's go through each of the seven habits. Habit one is to be proactive. And here, Covey clarifies that proactivity means more than just taking initiative. It means taking responsibility for our own lives. Proactive people are value-driven and unaffected by the whims of changing circumstances. They can subordinate their impulses, while reactive people are too often emotional, short-sighted, and dependent on guidance from others. Covey explains that we are conditioned then to respond to various stimuli and circumstances in our life. However, between stimulus and response is our greatest power, the freedom to choose our response. This freedom to choose how we react to what the world throws at us is best captured by the story of a man held at the Nazi concentration camps who reframed this suffering despite torture and imprisonment by imagining what teachings he would share with his students one day about this experience. By finding meaning in his suffering, he served as an inspiration to his fellow prisoners and guards as well. I think this quote by Eleanor Roosevelt really captures this. No one can hurt you without your consent. So the most effective among us are those who can transcend suffering and circumstance. There's another compelling story here of a man who says he and his wife no longer love each other, but they really must stay together for their kids. The man wonders how he can love her if he doesn't feel love. Covey then explains that love is a verb. So to rekindle your relationship, embody the actions of love. Listen to her deeply, support her, and be worthy of her love and reciprocation. Proactive people make love a verb. Proactivity then is about taking responsibility for our life by determining how we will respond to its challenges. For habit two, this chapter begins with an exercise that we can also try. Stop for a moment and venture into your mind's eye. Envision your funeral. What will your legacy be? Did you live a good life? What sort of associate, son, daughter, parent, 
cousin, or even sibling, would you like to be remembered as? The point here is to let the condition at the end of your life serve as the paradigm against which everything else is examined. To think with the end in mind is to consider strategically how each step you take in life contributes to your ultimate goal. Knowing where you want to end up will shape what you do to get there. So we either live by our own blueprints or by conditioned relations with others, past habits, and circumstances. So now, let's consider the difference between managers and leaders with this hypothetical. In the jungle, employee associates do the dirty work cutting through the underbrush, while managers follow close behind, devising incentives to keep them trimming through effectively. Whereas leaders, those are the ones who scale the trees to discern the right direction to be going in. The leader thinks proactively with the end in mind. The manager, well, they're simply reacting to the realities immediately in front of them. To think like a leader rather than a manager, try outlining a personal mission statement that organizes your core values and ambitions. This is your constitution. To live with the end in sight means to live with your values clearly identified. Habit one then has you recognize that you are indeed the programmer of your own life, while habit two suggests that you go ahead and write your program. Habit three is another great strategy, and it suggests that we put first things first, or in other words, we prioritize our lives based on our values. So take a moment here and imagine a time management matrix where we organize all the activities that consume daily life. In the first quadrant, there would be important and urgent matters, like say deadlines for a project. In the second quadrant, these are important but non-urgent matters, such as relationship building, bonding, growth, and personal reflection. These are the kind of things of really great long-term value without a call for action today. The third quadrant is the unimportant but urgent activities, like the daily emails and calls we give attention to that seem urgent but are really unimportant to our ultimate goals. And then the last quadrant, well, this would be the unimportant and non-urgent matters, such as the hours spent scrolling social media. Covey explains that we ought to focus on the important and non-urgent activities of the second quadrant. How much more effective could we be if we redirected wasted time on matters unimportant to our long-term goals and values? There's a really great quote here I love from the German writer Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Things which matter most should never be put at the mercy of things which matter least. So rekindling a fading friendship can't be crammed into a time slot on your calendar because you'll never be able to predict the appropriate amount of time to allocate to it. But you can outline this as your goal and commit to achieving it via whatever means necessary. So those who live primarily in the second quadrant can focus on these high leverage activities. The more proactive you are in addressing important but not necessarily time sensitive matters, the fewer emergencies you'll have to address later on. For example, more time spent eating healthy and exercising today reduces your future health issues. Habit three applies that logic to our relationships. Covey calls this next section the paradigm of interdependence and states you can't have the fruits without the roots, meaning that you cannot bear the rewards of effective relationships without putting in the work. It's impossible to have strong relations with others without first mastering our own internal order, which is really what the first three habits are intended to accomplish. In becoming independent, we can then choose to enter mutually beneficial interdependent relationships. And as investors, mastering our emotions is extremely important as well. Without self-control, how can we expect to effectively navigate volatile and uncertain financial markets? Covey introduces the concept then of emotional reserves between two people being like a bank account. Every time we make a connection with someone, act selflessly towards them, listen and keep our promises, we build trust with them that acts like a deposit in a bank account. As we make more deposits, the relationship strengthens and greater trust is built. But this, of course, takes time to accomplish. And when we violate their trust by acting selfish, rude, arrogant, or just in inconsiderate ways, we can quickly drain these bank reserves and undermine the relationship. When trust is high though, communication is easy and the relationship is flexible. When reserves are overdrawn, it will deteriorate as tension and mistrust build. Additionally, you may make withdrawals from your trust bank account without even knowing it, which is why constant effort to make positive trust deposits with those we interact with daily is vital. Otherwise, it will quickly become overdrawn and break down. 
In relationships, it's the small things that matter. Habit four is based on embracing the win-win mindset. This basically states that there are only a few different ways to think about interactions with others. Win-win, win-lose, lose-win, and lose-lose. But win-win isn't just a technique, it's a philosophy for human interaction. It constantly seeks mutual benefit based on mutual respect. All parties must feel good about the decision. It's not your way or my way, but it's a better way. Win-lose, on the other hand, prioritizes better outcomes for yourself at the expense of another. While common in sports and life, this approach fails and is unsustainable. In business, bosses may use their authority to force employees to follow their demands. In families, a parent's love might be contingent upon the child's willingness or ability to do something that the parent desires. And in your marriage, the question of who's winning is ridiculous. If both people aren't winning, then everyone is losing. Lose-win is a form of capitulation then where you give in to others. While this may be seen as noble in some cases, it is also unsustainable and destructive to the relationship. If you negotiate a contract with a business partner and win on their terms while you lose, surely you will seek to avoid working with them again in the future. These are ultimately weak and passive people who bury their feelings only to have them emerge later in a worse form. Lose-lose then is when two win-lose, close-minded people interact. Their stubbornness and ego will hinder any productive arrangement they hope to construct, thus producing the worst outcomes for them. Lose-lose in essence is the philosophy of war. So we must commit to a win-win or nothing at all. No need for a set of expectations moving forward that will not be advantageous. For example, it's better to hire someone who will add value in having the same goals and expectations rather than realizing later on that they don't and having to fire them. So how can we arrive at a win-win solution? Try deeply considering the issue from the other party's point of view with empathy. Identify the key issues and concerns that are involved, but not necessarily their positions on these issues. Determine what results would create an acceptable solution to both parties, and lastly, consider the options available to achieve those results. Habit five is based on deep listening. Seek first to understand and then to be understood. I love this quote here. You have two ears and one mouth. Use them accordingly. This chapter introduces a father who states, I cannot understand my son. He just doesn't listen to me. To which Covey replies, well, to understand someone, don't you need to be listening to them rather than them listening to you? So many of our relationships suffer from this dynamic as we say to ourselves, well, only if they understood me better. While words of advice filtered through your home movie may sound nice, the other person will often be stuck thinking that the advice is just meaningless since it's really about you and your biased perception of their issues. You wouldn't have much confidence in a doctor who prescribed you medicine before diagnosing your issue. In our communications, the point is that we often prescribe our opinion to others without actually understanding the matter from their perspective. Covey introduces empathic listening as the solution here based on rephrasing what the person is saying while still capturing their emotions rather than simply advising, judging, or mimicking them. So ask probing questions that dig deeper towards the root of the matter and recognize their paradigm. Empathic listening then is one of the most vulnerable things we can do as we open our heart and mind to another person's thinking and worldview. In law, lawyers gather all the details for a case before presenting their arguments. And many of the best lawyers also write out the opposing side's possible arguments beforehand. We ought to operate more in this spirit. We are so deeply scripted in responding to others with an I told you so mentality that we do not even realize how our language affects the other person. Only with empathic listening can we build the trust reserves to foster strong interdependent relationships. As the culmination of a win-win mindset and empathic listening, habit six is to synergize through creative collaboration. In synergy, we unleash people's greatest potential and find otherwise unknown possibilities. Synergy means that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. One plus one equals three or more. Family life is especially synergistic. A man and a woman can literally create new life where the sum of them as individuals is something brand new. 
In synergizing, we reject the status quo alongside our past scripting to create a whole new paradigm. The more authentic and genuine we are in our expression, the more effective we can be in building the trust necessary. Synergy then isn't just a compromise or a pleasantly enforced consensus. It's the discovery of a whole new frontier of possibilities. We must learn to value the differences between people and recognize that we see the world not how it is, but as we are, though others' differences can add to our knowledge and understanding of reality. Habit seven is based on the principle of renewal, meaning taking time for activities that help you reset physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Covey refers to this as sharpening your saw, which he explains in the story of a man who has been struggling for hours to chop down a tree, and when another man points out that he should take time to stop and sharpen his saw, he replies that he doesn't have time to. We often spend our days prioritizing matters that consume our energy rather than recognizing the importance of replenishing it. We can reset our bodies through exercise, healthy eating, meditation, prayer, or just relaxing with friends. Many think they don't have time for renewal, particularly to exercise, but in reality, we don't have time not to. And outside of school or work, how many of us read and write deeply? We can leave behind so much personal growth by ignoring these sorts of activities. In reading literature, you can cheaply access many of the greatest minds in the world. Think of how powerful it is to leverage this work, capturing life's important knowledge and wisdom. Now, connect this back to the time management matrix we discussed earlier as habit seven renewal is by definition a quadrant two behavior. Through renewal, we can learn to live in the second quadrant. So I wanna share another quote here from Goethe that really ties us all together well. Treat a man as he is, and he will remain as he is. Treat a man how he can and should be, and he will become how he can and should be. So hold yourself to a higher standard, and you will transform yourself therein. The seventh habit allows us to follow the first six habits more effectively. Without renewal, we will accomplish far less in utilizing these habits. How can one listen deeply to others or be proactive if consumed by stress and anxiety? To wrap things up today, remember that we have the power to rewrite our internal paradigms. If you've been treated poorly by others, Perhaps your default is to perpetuate that, but you can rewrite the scripting and instead reaffirm and unconditionally love. A tendency that has run through your family for generations can end with you. You are the bridge between past and future, and your descendants may thank you for thwarting patterns of abuse. As we practice implementing the seven habits, we hope for better lives defined by proactivity, long-term goals, empathy, interdependence, synergy, and lastly, renewal. And if we can effectively apply these habits, surely we will also find success as investors. That's it for this week, guys. If you've enjoyed this, please be sure to like, subscribe, and comment. We love hearing from you all, so please tell us your favorite habits from this book and let us know what other books we should review. And you can check out the description for more resources. Also, be sure to check out our other videos like host of Millennial Investing, Robert Leonard's video on replicating Peter Thiel's $5 billion Roth IRA.